Okie dokie. I have to switch the technology. One second. Yeah, it works. Good morning. Um, we have 20 minutes and uh, probably it will be a wild ride, um, an intellectual wild ride. And my understanding of creativity is not only focused on people who do nice designs, but I think that actually everyone who's working in this industry must be creative. So of course also a developer is a creative person. I have to say, tell this, uh, say this because um, uh, a certain level of abstraction will be uh, mandatory to follow my talk and I hope I do a good job. Because it's a story about uh, my work and my path within uh, communication and cybernetics. And what that all means I will tell you in a bit. A short introduction, who I am and what is my story and why do I have grey hair here. Um, <laughs> I'm born in 71 and my wife um, calls me Marki Schnitzel, um, like also other Twitter users can call me like that. We are a small family, an international bunch, and I'm sorry to say, and maybe I offend here some people from Cologne, but even though I'm from Düsseldorf, I'm not into carnival. So if I go out, I have to hide myself and look like a ninja or something like that. I like everything that is related to water, diving, sailing. I run around and explore micro worlds with my macro lens. And when I have the time, I sit outside, collect photons, and I like to photograph nebula, stars, and stuff like that. But uh, on a professional level, if I have to yeah, create some sort of a condensed version, what I'm interested in, it's basically everything about communication, how to create value for the customer, Cybernetics, again, this strange term that I will explain a little bit later on, and applied epistemology. And now you might ask yourself, okay, epistemology, what the heck tries Mark to tell us? Uh, epistemology is the science about knowledge and the question, how do I know and how can I know that I know what I know? So basically, I'm actually dealing with um, a classic, a genius, the topic, with Kant and his four essential questions that I think that work pretty well also in our creative industry. So what do I know about the customer, the client, the market? What do I have to do after I've understood what I know? What can I hope for? What can we achieve? And of course, we're talking about customer centricity. It's actually a pretty old topic. So what is a human being, capabilities, needs, opinions, etc., that I need to do a successful job in getting people into a communication loop? My path, super short. In 1980, my brain was, uh, yeah, got in contact with this video game Pong and I was lost. I played then for many years in these days uh, with computers and this uh, funny stuff that was available at these times. I left school with a so-so <laughs> great. And then, yeah, my, my journey started for five years to explore what the heck will I do. I attended also, I registered for um, the university and um, pretty soon I realized that this is not my way. So I did a lot of strange jobs um, and in the end and now, ha ha, nowadays it's a joke but for me it was serious. I had my insight, I have to do something creative with computers and medias, so uh, media. So nowadays people say, what do you do something with media? That was my personal insight. So 1995, with four friends, each of us took 800 Deutschmarks, quite an investment sum, huh? and we founded Animotion. A little wordplay from the word or the term animation. So we actually originally started as a 3D animation company, but then, um, yeah, things changed. I converted in quotes to the internet after I got my first contact with HTML and nonlinear storytelling and all these possibilities. I was totally infected and then over the time, yeah, a lot of things were done. Um, and it was fun for me, also it was fun to work for some nice brands, some nice uh, companies and nice projects. I have to admit I'm actually relatively proud about the DLR, Deutsche Zentrum für Luft und Raumfahrt, the German NASA, because as you have seen, no, I'm interested in space and then for the first time I could claim, yes, it's rocket science. But after 20 years, I got terribly bored. Everything was perfect. I, left, uh, I was living in my golden cage, a nice income, stable processes, nice client relationships, blah, blah. But somehow I thought, okay, uh, in the age of 44, hey, I have to change something. So I got out of the company and sold my shares. Um, 
my bank account was happy so far, it was cool, I could live, I could afford uh, to take some time off, and especially since I never studied, I thought, okay, now it's the time to put some information into my brain, especially because I was always asking myself, how can I manage this complexity and the organization of an agency with all this volatility, with these crazy clients who change their opinion every two seconds? And um, how is it possible to make profits, um, have a good comp corporate culture, be innovative, etc. PP. And then somehow I ended up in cybernetics. And now finally it's the time maybe to explain this term because it has nothing to do with, um, I don't know, science fiction and freezing people, that's cryonics. Um, cybernetics is actually the science about loops, communications, elements, parts, and systems, and how systems work, and how they function. And one major question when you deal with cybernetics is the question, what is actually complexity? and How can we explain complexity? And this is now a new my, uh, my effort uh, to break my own record uh, to explain complexity. In the end, complexity is something that depends on certain elements that you have, their relations to each other, how they behave in terms of time, how you have sometimes dilatation effects and it takes maybe some time till one aspect or element influences the other um, element. And all, from all of this, you get topologies, organizations. And it's funny nowadays um, when you use usually your org chart and then you see that reality is something that is more like a network. And the basic question is then, okay, how do we deal with this complexity actually? And I dare to say, you all are masters or you all must be masters of complexity because otherwise you couldn't survive in this industry. You must be able to be agile, to transform yourself and change and all these buzzwords that in the moment are going on, especially in the corporate world. So I assume that you all intuitively know how to understand patterns, how to work with nonlinear feedback causalities, where you don't have a typical A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D, and then there is something like a result. We have these yeah, strange effects in complexity. And one thing, of course, that makes it really nasty, that sometimes we have to think in networks of networks. Who? Well, as you've seen, I have a technical background, and then my first question is always, okay, and how do I measure it? Can I measure it? And how do I deal with it? And I have here a little example. Probably chess is a, no, a well-known game for you. Um, we have uh, two colors, eight by eight field, uh, six um, tokens, and certain rules which define the relations on how to move these pieces on the board. And obviously, if you want to be a good um, chess player, you must be some kind of a genius. Why? Because you must be able to handle, theoretically, an event space or possible states of 10 to the 15th of possible states on the board game. So we talk about 100 octillion, crazy number, possible states that this game can have. And these possible states are a nice way to measure complexity. But you can always accelerate things. Who knows the game Go or ever played the game Go? Okay, then you maybe have an idea how damn complex Go is. Even though you have less rules, less tokens, you create a, a space, a possible space of different positions on the board. Well, 10 to the 117th, which is quite a lot. It's that much. So maybe you get an idea how complexity can be measured, can be compared, how many states does the system have. And of course, like always um, in the world, it's nice to have a term for this um, strange expression, possible states of the system. And in cybernetics, we use the term variety. What is the variety of a system? And as you have seen, chess, has a, a smaller a variety compared to Go. And that is interesting also in another sense. And this is a ge generic insight that nobody in the typical economic world knows because people who studied uh, normal economics, BVL, um, they ne have never heard about Ashby's law of requisite variety. And this law describes how to gain control 
control not in terms of oppression or treating, uh, treating people bad, but on a very theoretical level, it explains how I, as a controller, have to have a higher variety or equal as the uh, context or the situation that I want to control. Little example, I want to build a house and um, I can do the elect uh, electrics and everything that is uh, related to the water stuff. But still, I need someone who builds the roof and so on. So in order to build the house, the context, the situation that I want to achieve, I have to enhance my variety. I need more skills, more than my own skills. I need a team, a wonder, a team, uh, cross-functional, that works together in order to master the situation. And this is important because often when we encounter a complex situation, what is our for first uh, reaction? <gasps> we have to reduce the complexity. We have to reduce the complexity. And it's okay, of course, we have to reduce the complexity. But my suggestion is the first step should be always what kind of possible states I might have to, uh, I will encounter, and then what does it mean for my configuration of my team or my skill set or resources that I might need in order to master this. So always when you encounter a, um, a complex situation, please, please don't follow your instinct and reduce it, stand it, and ask yourself, okay, what do I need, maybe um, which people, which persons in order to master the situation. And the problem is, in all this complexity, the old organization paradigm is something like this. Yeah? Boss, maybe people sitting maybe in the same location, in the same office or skills. And sometimes you are lucky and um, organizations put people together into teams, so each square is a team and not um, a, a skill that is grouped there. But the problem is, often enough, these org charts, especially in large corporations or in huge projects, they create confusion. People don't know who is in charge for what, at which moment I do I have to talk with whom, and then sometimes there's also the question, who's actually the true boss, and to whom I'm actually delivering the money. And I think there is a genius, and this genius is called Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer created or discovered I guess it was there, but he saw it, the viable system model. Viable, viability, uh, means it's the ability to maintain your own existence. Well, what a system is, we had this in the complexity part, and a model, very important, a model, I had to do this flame animation. Um, <laughs> this, um, a model is just a tool. It helps me to understand reality, to work with reality, but it's never the truth. And it's not the reality itself. It's, a, of course, still a reduction of reality, but I can work with it. And if it solves problem, it's nice. So it's, to my opinion, always the question, is it useful or not? And what a wonder, I think, the VSM, the viable system model, is very useful. A little story about Stafford. In uh, the early 1970s, he got a call from President Allende in Chile. After a very conservative um, um, uh, times in Chile, he was the first socialist president elected in Chile. And he was invited, uh, Stafford Beer was invited by him to create a new economic model for the whole nation. And why? Because it was obvious uh, also in these days that uh, the Soviet system with five-year planning does not match with reality. Too much is happening in these five years. So how can you project goals and uh, uh, specify production lines, etc., with a forecast of five years? So he went there, started to work for one and a half years just to uh, analyze the whole economy and then the first little experiments were started and they did something that you might have seen before, the so-called DevOps room. So they had this vision that um, the important uh, people of the country sit together, they have real-time data, they see what's happening in the economy, which supplies are needed where. I love, by the way, this ashtray here, 70s. It <laughs> um, looks also a little bit like Star Trek. It's part of pop culture, so to say. But then, unfortunately, there was um, a 9-11, the first 9-11. And the US were not the victims, but they were the aggressors. 
And this is not fake news, and this is not, this is a part of the history books, which are written by the winners, but that's another story. So uh, in 9-11, uh, 1973, um, um, uh, uh, Allende ended his life because he said, the last bullet is on my account. And uh, what followed with Pinochet in Chile, you maybe know it from history, not so nice. That broke also Stafford Beer's heart, one has to say. Um, he recovered, of course, and he st still kept working till his last day. Um, he lived uh, till 2002. But that was, of course, a tremendous change. But still, his model has something to tell us. And um, as I said, it will be now a little bit more, uh, a little bit abstract in the, the next minutes. So to make it short, two quotes, two takeaways right now for you. Number one, positive. The purpose of a system is what it does. And so it's super nice to have plans. It's a super nice you know, to have a conception. But if your conception does not work, and if it does not deliver the desired results, it's worthless. So the question is, what is really happening? And there's this dangerous word, really. What is really? I mean, hello, reality. What is reality? Can anybody explain to me what is reality? Maybe. I have a problem with reality, so it's important that's the second quote, think before you think. And I know it's annoying, people don't like it, we want to have always fast solutions, we want to have our cooking recipes, but when we're dealing with complexity, we have to use our brain. And actually it's fun. So what is the wireless system all about? To make it um, short, it's a model that is so abstract that you can explain how the central nervous system of the, in the human body works, an ant colony, or a multinational global operating corporation. So it's isomorph, it has the same shape. And one can say, it's so to say the brain of the firm, that's by the way also a title of a book from Stafford Beer. So how does it work? And maybe in the next slides you will see also slight differences to the normal hierarchical diagram. So I ask you please have it in parallel in the in back of your mind when I tell you that at first we have an environment. Oh wonder, a system is not floating in space. It's somehow in an environment connected. And you, there you have an operation that does something, that delivers the value. And then you have the management. And the function of the management is to support the operation in fulfilling its purpose. That means the management is not responsible for the um, uh, operational results, but for everything else. The management has to give the operation the frame, the resources, the rules that they need to be successful. And it's very important, even though now for the next um, uh, sequence I pull this apart, please think of this always as a whole. That's the point about the viable system model. It's about wholeness. It's not about the operation is more worth than the management or the management is more worth than the operation. No, they're equally both worth in their function, what they have to do. And what is happening here, we had had this variety, this possible states, requests from customers that flow into the operation. They do something, they deliver something back, and the management provides all the, let's say, background uh, infrastructure that is necessary to be successful for the operation. And in order to make this happen, and this is a basic principle that's right now working also in your brains, we have to damp, filter the incoming information. And then the outgoing information is kind of an amplification act. A little example. A customer is here on the website and he configures a product, a car. And then from all these possibilities, this car with this specification, interior, engine, blah, 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 color, this information comes into the operation. Then you have the different parts, still not assembled, worthless for the client, but in the moment we build the things together. Then we amplify and we create value for the customer. And then there's the same thing here with the management. They don't need to know all the details of what's going on in operations, but only the relevant ones. For instance, we need more people, we need new machines, I don't know, whatever, and they give them the plans. This is a very basic principle. Next thing is, 
And Stefan Beer was really a master in inventing words. Um, you need someone who takes care about the transfer of the information because each time an information passes from one system to the other, it must be safe that the other one understands what is said because the operation usually has a different language than the management, especially when you think in terms of brick and mortar industry. And then last but not least, you need someone who regulates the whole thing because this is a typical hierarchical situation, but a reg regulator is there to compare what are the goals, the targets of the management, and what are the capabilities, the real true capabilities of operation. And they must be matched into a feasible plan that we are, stay viable, that we don't kill ourselves. And I mean, maybe the one or, uh, one or other of you have heard about the word burnout. So we have here the basic elements, how it works, and everything that I will tell you now, which create, uh, will be brought up here, is part of this. So the operation of a viable system is usually a viable system in itself. It is, a recursive, it is the recursive nature of viability. It's like a fractal. You can zoom into the structures from a large company to the department, team level. You always find the same functions. And that's the cool thing maybe, also in times where everybody's talking now about Scrum, Kanban, Agile, Lean, UX, blah, blah, blah. Old story, Stafford Beer, 59, said, of course, in every complex organization here on this horizontal axis, we need self-organization. The management cannot know everything. They have to trust and they have to give the people the resources to be successful. And of course, usually you have more than one operational system in a company. You have many, but they don't fit here into the screen. So please imagine here's maybe a lot more. And this must, must be coordinated. Maybe the people who work with Scrum, you know, the 50-minute um, daily, for instance, that's a typical function here. You put your daily there inside to coordinate your daily activities, what do you have to achieve, what you do have to do, blah, blah. Then you need a system three that is responsible that all these operational um, units can work well together. So it's not about micromanagement. It's not about the boss who steps into the room and tells the programmer, make this database blue. This is stupid. But he has to give him the resources that he needs to make a nice blue database. So we are, have already um, almost all the parts that we need, but um, there's a topic that nobody likes, and that's the question about the auditing. We need some sort of control in every viable system. But the question is, how do I work with this function? Do I use this audit channel like the Spanish Inquisition? And uh, people are feared and are afraid here, down there. Or do I do um, an audit uh, in an agreement with the local management so that we find the anom anomalies, anomalies in the system and we can get better. It's actually a learning function. So controlling is actually okay. It's cool to find errors because then we can get better. Last but not least, we need someone who looks into the future, who sees what's happening in the market, what is changing. We need our strategists, our seers, the people in the ship in the highest spot who uh, can warn in front of reefs or say, hey, there's the golden island, let's sail there. And they deliver the scenarios and uh, input in, uh, for inf uh, information uh, in order to prepare ourselves for an upcoming future. And then last but not least, we have to close the loop because that's also maybe a takeaway for you. Always close the loop. Don't trust loops who are open. They are not open. And sorry for the finger. Um, <laughs> and um, this is the system five, the ultimate authority in a viable system and they deliver in the end the identity, the norms, the values, the belief system, which allows us to select strategies, to explore new possibilities, to break it down then on a tactical level that we really do what we have thought about. So again, it's nice about planning, but we want to get our plan into action. And what can I do with this thing? Well, a lot of stuff. With this model, I help companies, for instance, to take their normal org charts, plus their communication patterns, and then some kind of mapping is happening. And then usually you find spots where the organization is very strong, and you see, but, but you also see the weak spots and the room for improvisation. 
So very quick, because the time is up, what for? I mean, it's nice to organize and, okay, Mark, thank you, cybernetic model. In the end, it's all about customer centricity and I'm working in the moment on my own framework. So I'm trying to condense now my 20 years of experience and uh, I do not, do not want to rely anymore on my intuition and not only on my intuition, but systemize the things. So boring picture, probably you have seen some of them or similar of them often enough. And uh, what I'm doing now and what, what I will release pretty soon at the end of the year is um, the first part is my persona canvas because every consultant nowadays has to have his own canvas. Huh? And um, yeah, uh, it's too detailed to talk now about it. Um, you will get it for free plus a little uh, explanation how to use it. But maybe it's interesting to, know, uh, to note that you know, besides of, of course demographics and social cultural infos and psychographics How's the user going on with technology, media, blah, blah. And then I have to show you, uh, bec um, because I like it so much, probably it will confuse you, that's why, sorry, um, a view into my toxic chamber, so to say, the Walter White of cybernetics, because um, that's in the moment um, um, a visualization uh, where I see how the system is embedded in an environment which kind of relationships do I have and which kind of values do I have to deliver? And it's still incomplete, it's under construction, but I wanted to show you maybe also for a conception part, for the people who do concepts, maybe this inspires you a little bit to think different about what is going on outside and what do we do have to do uh, inside. Yeah, and then of course there's still stuff missing. No? Where is technology happening there? The ecosphere, I mean climate change is going on. Um, it's a critical topic from my point of view to be successful economically. Um, yeah, it will be um, uh, extended over the time. Yeah, so thanks so much for your attention and for staying so brave for this hardcore, abstract, cybernetic network theory stuff. And if you're interested, in, if you want to read more about me in German, sorry. Uh, no, I have one article in English, um, <laughs> one <laughs> for my friends. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for all this interesting um, talk. Um, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, ich stelle die Frage jetzt einfach mal auf Deutsch. <laughs> Und zwar, ähm, so wie ich deine, deine Grafik verstehe, sagst du ja, dass ähm, das Management quasi die, das operative Geschäft äh, managt. Also das heißt, das Management gibt wahrscheinlich auch irgendwelche äh, Regeln vor, gibt die Aufträge an die Operativen, also die, die es nachher umsetzen. Ähm, ich sehe das, also gerade so in der heutigen Zeit sieht man da eigentlich so einen Wandel. Ähm, weil ich denke, dass gerade oft die, die im Management sitzen, gar nicht mehr so aktuell am, am aktuellen Tagesgeschäft involviert sind und gar nicht unbedingt ähm, das vielleicht einschätzen können, was eigentlich das Team braucht oder was, ähm, äh, was, ja, also was vielleicht auch zum Beispiel, wenn es jetzt irgendwie um gerade in dieser Experience Design geht, was vielleicht auch der Nutzer braucht, ähm, sondern haben eigentlich oft nur so diese Zahlen vor Augen und äh, man geht ja, also eigentlich ist ja ein guter Ansatz, dass das dass, es, dass man gar kein richtiges Management mehr hat, sondern dass das Team sich quasi selbst organisiert. Also das Team nicht Darf ich da sofort, ja. ich, ich, I switch again uh, back to English. Um, okay, my explanation was not uh, tight enough, obviously. Explicitly, here are only functions. So if you, for instance, uh, Dunkelfeld, yeah, not only the um, managing directors are part of this, but maybe the whole company, You can have a meeting once per year and ask what is our identity, what, our, uh, what, our, what are our values, blah, blah, blah. And then you start to steer your ship based on this input. So it's not the question how it is done. So please, 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 I'm totally on your side. It's stupid if a manager starts to work around here. Let the experts do their job and just give them the resources that they need to be successful. But Because in the moment when Fabian would go down here, yeah, okay, 
then he's an operational unit, but he's not a manager anymore, which is fine. But often enough, people have the problem that they don't understand this micromanagement. Does anybody ever had a job, who like, uh, a, a boss, who likes micromanagement? Okay, I see a few people, good. I guess I do not have to um, say anything more. So totally, that's the point. We need self-organization on the operation level, super important. And these are only functions, and how you initiate these functions or work with these instances depends on you. For instance, when we want to explore the future, yeah, I can use here on this uh, channel design thinking. Yeah? I buy a design, design thinker and uh, he helps me to develop a prototype for something new, blah, blah, blah. So it's only a frame, it's a meta frame, it's a reference model. But it does not uh, tell, it's ex exactly the opposite. I'm sorry that my explanation was not precise enough. It's not about, oh, here's the big master, he explains everything and then down there, Bish, bish, the slaves sit no? <laughs> on the galera and row. But maybe in the future we uh, won't need a management because maybe the, the operative team um, could send requests uh, for resources and stuff like that uh, by themselves. You know? Okay, so, yeah, then we have so to talk about the, management. The unit or the team. Um, could, uh, could say, okay, we need now a UX designer, we need a developer, I don't know. And we don't need anymore the management team just for the, yeah, I, I don't know for what. Maybe not the management team, but the management functions. And we can share, of course, functions in a team. That's possible. The question is always for me, the decision action cycle time. How long does it take to make a decision? And then, to get into the doing. And when a team is well organized, if people trust e each other and so on, then of course you can um, uh, kick the boss, the classical uh, boss function. I'm totally with you. But still, there, in, a, in a corporation, from my point of view, we always have to solve problems. And the question is, how do we design this problem solving pro process that it's efficient, no, effective, <laughs> at first effective and then efficient. So, um, for instance, holacracy, uh, it's a big thing. Does anybody know holacracy here in the room? Yeah, I think it's a, a, a wonderful way to construct pseudo-hierarchical systems, my personal, um, my personal um, impression. Because what happened when I got in contact with the um, VSM, for 20 years I was running around, I read for 20 years no management books. I hated management books. But then, since I was thinking of myself, the company feels more like an organism and I want to have a model uh, that deals with life, viability. And then I stepped into this and then I discovered from it, this is a super subjective, super distorted personal um, impression. Yeah, these are the patterns that I need. I need my identity, my values for my strategies to do the tactics to get the shit done. Et voila. And forget about all these lines and this abstraction stuff and think only in these four terms, identity, strategy, tactics. That's for me a default management pattern. And it doesn't matter if it's a manager, if it's a self-organized team, you need these functions. Because when you know your identity, you know why you're getting up each morning and dress up. Don't lay in the couch the whole day and watch TV or whatever. So um, that's maybe, thanks for your question, because now I have the chance to emphasize this. It's just about the functions and what they should produce, but it does not explain how we do this here. So you can have a voting, you can have democratic structures, you can have autocratic structures. Last but not least, and this is a, a bad example, but that's why I think that it works. Imagine this asshole which did uh, on the Ramblas yesterday uh, a, a terror attack. They have a fucking strong identity. Why they do this? And they know they will die, but they don't care because their values and their system is so strong that they choose these strategies and act then with these tactics in reality. You can explain theoretically also um, Germany between 33 and 45 with this. They have also a very strong identity and they have their strategies, blah, blah, blah. So this is actually the a typical management pattern that I see here. And 
the point is, uh, if people, one of you uh, can, I don't know, relate to this, then don't think uh, you have to go now to the, your desk and say, okay, from tomorrow on we do the VSM. That is bullshit. But you can use it as a, as a perspective, as a, as a new viewport to see other relations, connections, interdependencies, um, etc. I think that's what's good for. So it's not the point that you say, no, okay, from tomorrow we, we make VSM. By the way, Dunkelfeld exists now for how many years? Uh, it's, 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 uh, 2010, so it's been seven years. Okay, you're, you're over the magical five years, you're established. Obviously, you're doing something right. I bet, yeah, not everything, of course. Eh? It's always a game. <laughs> Room for improvement. But I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, so far in every organization that I work with, I was able to spot the different functions and also how they are really done. So not Geschäftsführung, Konzeption, Projektleiter, Accounter, die Schweine, die armen Säue im, ähm, <lacht> huch, Mark, uh, in the machine room. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a meta model, it's a reference frame. That makes it also very hard to work with it. Uh, it's not a cooking recipe. You really have to think a lot. That's why I said, think before you think. Anyone else? It's a normal reaction for me, by the way. <laughs> I know that after my talks, people always go, okay. But maybe tomorrow or one day later. Um, you said you use this model for mapping existing companies against your model. Yeah. And you see where they're typically good and where they are not so good. Yeah. Do you see patterns when you compare different companies or different maybe regions or sectors? Yeah. I did a little bit of finance um, uh, recently, a bank, and for instance here on this is now the VSM nerd in me. Uh, I could see that here on a specific channel that was totally overloaded. 150 regulations for all day work for the normal bank account employee working in the bank. 150 rules. Each rule described on two to three DNA4 pages. Who has the variety, the capability to remember all this stuff? It's crazy. It's not possible. Okay, now it's a bank, they have compliance, blah, 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 everything that is coming also from the regulator side. So the solution is pretty simple. Digitize it. Make it possible for the people to ask a question and then get in the context the question. In the end, for the moment, just a search function. But still, that was, uh, for instance, uh, a thing I could see here is a congestion on this part. And then the question, how can we make this information better available? Or a typical thing, I mean, look to the Trump administration. <laughs> Do they have a strategy at all? <laughs> Definitely there's a belief system and that it's me, I'm the best, uh, Trump. Um, so uh, usually uh, I see in the uh, service sector the problem that the people do not understand who's actually creating the value. Often in agencies, uh, programmers, designers, UX, and I tell them, no, 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 the company is not, uh, the, your client is not paying for design. He's paying for a project and you need a cross-functional team. So actually the accounts must be the system one. That's one explanation. And another thing maybe, last but not least, often due to this recursive nature yeah, and that it's contained in itself, you see where things are done uh, double or twice. You can easily find redundancies. That's another thing. And yeah, of course, the, the whole topic of communication, trust, and so on. And this is then here, for instance. Because Stefan Beer said, yeah, we need an audit channel, but only sporadically and not always. I don't want to work with the boss who always stands here next to me and <laughs> is looking like that. Uh, I cannot work. So you can also detect some of the soft features of human communication. Yeah. Global bluff. Good. <laughs> Check it. Okay, uh, then we will finish it here. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. Thank you that you uh, were here and joined us. Um, you can grab some food and coffee before you start your day. And yeah, have a nice day. Hope to see you next month. <laughs>